One of the most uh, amazing things that's happening at the moment under Pope Francis is the beginnings of a historic breakthrough between the Catholic Church and evangelicals worldwide. And this has come about, and this is very Francis, because of a very uh, deep friendship he had with a man called Bishop Tony Palmer. Palmer and Francis formed a deep friendship in Buenos Aires many, many years ago. And after Francis became Pope, uh, he invited uh, Tony Palmer to come and see him. And at the meeting, Tony Palmer said that he was going to be addressing the following week a meeting of uh, megachurch leaders in Texas, uh, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And Francis recorded a video message. So Tony Palmer recorded on his iPhone a video message from Pope Francis to those megachurch leaders. Well, the effect of that message was extraordinary. It was electric. Um, and uh, Tony Palmer himself gave a very passionate speech saying, look, you know, the Reformation is over. <laughs> Uh, we actually no longer disagree. So Tony Palmer, uh, over many months when I was writing the book and we met uh, um, while I was writing the book uh, to talk about what, he, what was happening uh, as Tony Palmer was building up a, a lot of uh, names of people who wanted in some way to be part of this new unity initiative uh, with the Pope. And in June uh, this year there was a meeting between uh, very, very significant evangelical uh, leaders representing something like 800 million uh, evangelicals across the world uh, and Pope Francis. And at that meeting they gave him the draft of a declaration which is a declaration which they are planning to make public and to sign in 2017. That's the latest uh, that I heard. And this declaration will, will say basically that there is no rivalry between Catholics and Evangelicals, that they can pray, work together and mission together. They are no longer rivals. Now this is yeah, tremendous, uh, tremendously significant. I was just recently uh, in Rome with his widow, Emiliana Palmer, and bishops from the CEEC who were meeting Francis, and I've learned that uh, Emmy Palmer, Tony's uh, widow, and Archbishop Robert Wise of the CEEC are taking this forward now, um, and I think that will happen. I am sure that one of the legacies of this pontificate will be this historic uh, declaration. But with evangelicals, with charismatic Catholics, with people who are, if you like, not haven't got that baggage, institutional baggage, then you know they are capable of witnessing together, praying together, working together in a way that just perhaps isn't possible with some of the uh, older uh, churches. And so I think we're going to see a major breakthrough there. Uh, you know, so he believes in, in what he calls a reconciled diversity. So it is possible to be you know, a completely believing, Bible-believing, evangelical Christian uh, and also to be a totally you know, Eucharistic, sacramental Catholic and you retain your identity but that doesn't stop you because you're both you have a shared baptism you both believe in the same god you're both open to the presence of the holy spirit then stuff can happen god can work through that and his point i think is that we need to allow the holy spirit to work through us in our common mission and then frankly the institutional theological divergent the convergence will happen as a result of that well it was fascinating being at the synod because uh, it was clearly a group there who are deeply unhappy with the direction of the papacy and the church under Francis and they made their views known. They used the synod I think as a way of expressing that discontent uh, and I, they're certainly going to make life difficult for Francis going forward. However, my other sense being at the synod was that actually most of the bishops are with him. I mean actually 80-90% of the residential bishops from dioceses are totally with the Pope. Um, they want to explore how to make the church uh, a more pastoral place, how to make the church teaching fuller so that it includes more of the merciful love of God without compromising essential church teachings. So in other words, the, the, the mission of Pope Francis, which is, which is to move the church in that direction, I think he has most of the bishops with him. Now, there are a few who say, if we try and do that, we go down this route, we're going to sacrifice clarity, we're going to sacrifice the importance of the clear witness of Christianity in a world which is trying to make the church water down its teachings. So um, they, will, they, they, they were very active in the sin, they will continue to be active, but I don't think that they're going to in any way present ultimately uh, a division for the church. I don't think, in other words, that the Francis 
uh, papacy is in any way imperiled by this. Yeah, I mean, the Catholic Voices is a, is a project which we created in 2010 to put the church's case on TV and radio. So we have teams of speakers, and we're, they're ordinary Catholics. I mean, they're, they're obviously educated and articulate Catholics, but they're not specialists or theologians. So it's actually a good way of finding out what, what Catholics think. Uh, I think they want to see a church which is more missionary, <clears throat> more effective at getting its message across. They want to see a church also which is um, which is attractive and they also want of course at a very basic level to try and get rid of or move on from those things which have kept the church back, namely certain scandals and dysfunctions whether it's in the Vatican or with the clerical sex abuse crisis. Well it's always striking to me when I go to Rome to find that actually the enthusiasm for Pope Francis, which of course is phenomenal, remains phenomenal in the wider world, isn't particularly shared in Rome. Uh, and in fact, you talk to uh, Vatican officials and, and they look very worried. And they say, we don't understand what's going on. Uh, we don't know what he's doing. We, we, we can't make him out. Uh, now, you know, I know from you know, my, my biography of Francis from having spoken to many, many people who knew, knew him and worked with him in Argentina. Uh, that, that he is a disconcerting leader and he doesn't operate through institutional channels. He actually deeply respects institutions, but he, he, he doesn't operate primarily through you know, departments and strategies. He has a very, very personalistic way of operating. So when he finds the right person, um, he'll, see, he'll see that person as being the vehicle then of the change. He is shaking things up in Rome, so actually most of the department heads don't know whether they're still going to be there in a few months' time. In fact, most of them I think are fairly confident that they won't be. So that produces a kind of uncertainty and an insecurity. Um, but he's not afraid of that. See, here's the thing about Francis you know, that I learned in doing, this, in doing my book, is that he's not afraid of living in the tension. And he believes that in the tension, is actually where the Holy Spirit is allowed to operate. So this is the remarkable thing about Pope Francis. What we have is a Pope who is, as somebody said to me in Argentina, he's a combination of uh, a brilliant manager and a desert saint. You know, he's, he, he's Machiavelli, you know, plus Saint Francis. You know, uh, he, he really understands government, he understands management, but above all, he understands spirituality. And this is what's just so unusual about him. Uh, and, and you sense that um, bishops and the cardinals there can speak freely. Um, that's what Pope asked them to do, and, and, and they did it. And it was, it was quite exciting, really, to, to, to see this see this in action. Um, but I think what what we've taken from it is this this process that Pope Francis has started, because it really is allowing the church to kind of discuss these issues, which are so important. I mean, in Africa, uh, people might think that you know, everyone's following Catholic Church teaching to the lesson, but actually in Africa they've got huge problems with polygamy, with child brides, the, and, and those kind of things. I know obviously in Western Europe there are difficulties with the financial pressures on married couples and families. So I think in the pews, that is one of the, the main uh, concerns. Um, and I think there's, there is this sense that there's a disconnect between what the Church teaches and what is, what is lived. And that was a big concern. What we'll see is, is, is two things. I think we'll see a new language, a new approach. I think we'll also see more and more debates. I think there will see more and more disagreements um, because Pope has opened up this discussion. Um, well, there were a number of parts that weren't happy with the way the discussions went to the Synod. Cardinal Pell was one of them, and I interviewed him. And he was, was not happy, and he produced to me, gave to me a uh, piece of paper with his handwritten thoughts about where the, the Synod document was going wrong. Um, it was tendentiously incomplete, in his words. The Pope says in his um, absolute exhortation, you know, Genium Gaudium, which is this kind of big blueprint for his papacy, he says, Reality is stronger than ideas. So it's the pastoral realities on the ground that the church has to respond to.